everyone, welcome back. A quick announcement. If you're looking for a birding trip in 2024, Dr. David Bird and his friend, Dr. Titman, will be leading a birding trip in Kenya in April. So if you're interested, reach out to them. In previous years, we've talked about using marigolds as natural pest control in vegetable gardens, but this year we've actually planted extra marigolds all over our property. Deer seem to leave them alone, but we've also learned that grackles use marigold flowers for anting. This is what birds do to take care of their feather mites. We haven't caught them doing that, but the summer is not over yet. Another thing that's become quite a staple in our vegetable garden is scarlet runner beans. Not because we like to eat them, but because hummingbirds go absolutely crazy for their flowers. These beans are very inexpensive to plant, they are very easy to maintain, they grow really fast and they produce flowers for a long time. I do enjoy watching hummingbirds at my hummingbird feeders, but it's such a delight to see them hover all over those uh, scarlet runner beans. Right now I'm actually starting another batch just in the pot to see if we can extend the season just a little bit before hummingbirds leave. A lot of you and us here at Brome Bird Care have been really concerned about birds being affected by wildfires. So Dr. Bird has prepared a report on what's happening to birds. The staff at Brome Bird Care are certainly right to be worried about the impact of the wildfires on our birds. The most obvious negative impact is the immediate loss of habitat to the flames. And since these wildfires are taking out grasses and trees right in the middle of the breeding season, they not only directly destroy the homes of the birds in these locations, but the flames and the heat also kill the eggs and nestlings, both directly and indirectly due to the parents abandoning their nest to save their own lives. And there are some adult birds of some species that are not as mobile in the air as others and they may well get caught in the flames. Take those 60 or so American white pelicans that showed up on Vancouver Island this summer, a place that they're not normally found. It's my guess that those birds were likely nesting on a lake in the interior of British Columbia and either the fire and or smoke drove them to leave the area to avoid dying. Judging by the time they showed up on the island, they likely left their eggs and young in their nest to perish in the fire. Pelicans could easily cover 500 miles in a single day, so it was no big feat for them to vacate the area. But it's not just direct mortality in adults and young dying in the flames that's of concern. There are also serious consequences from breathing in the smoke. Birds in general have very high metabolic rates and thus require large amounts of oxygen for their activities. They possess a highly sophisticated and efficient system of air sacs working in conjunction with a pair of lungs very different from mammalian lungs. Not only does the inhaled smoke cause an impairment of the system, but it also damages the tissues, sometimes beyond repair. This can also make them more susceptible to various infections. Equally damaging to the respiratory ability is the fact that wood fire smoke contains an untold number of toxic chemicals. To put this in perspective, cigarette smoke has more than 400. We have no idea the impact of these chemicals on bird health. There's really only one good thing about forest fires. They do lead to a renewal of open habitat and lots of dead snags which can benefit a select number of bird species. Blackback woodpeckers and some owl and warbler species come to mind. But the level at which forest fires are raging across Canada in 2023, they are undoubtedly a very bad thing for our birds in our country. I just love these stories where the birds manage to turn the tables on humans and outsmart us. You've probably seen those metal spikes placed on street lamps and building ledges to deter birds from nesting on them. While these spikes might be effective most of the time, I've personally seen pigeons beat them by just dumping tons of sticks on top of them to make a platform for nesting. But this latest development takes the cake. Apparently birds in several locations in European cities are ripping the spikes out and building nests with them. Incorporating thorny branches as nest materials, particularly as an outside covering to ward off predators and protect eggs and young, is nothing new for many bird species especially in Africa and Latin America, where one can find plenty of plants with thorns. But in Europe, and especially in cities, thorny nesting materials in short supply. That is, until some ingenious birds discovered that they can use the anti-bird spikes that are in abundance. Before even reading about this adaptive behavior, 
I knew that the clever birds were going to be Corvids, the collective term for ravens, crows, jays, and magpies, arguably the smartest birds on the planet. And indeed, it is carrion crows and Eurasian magpies that first engage in this innovative behavior. In one tree near a hospital in Antwerp, Belgium, a magpie made a nest containing around 1,500 metal spikes. The spikes on the side of the building closest to the tree were gone, while those on the other side were still intact. This pretty much means that the birds have been ripping the spikes out, as opposed to collecting loose spikes. What's really clever is the birds have been positioning these spikes with the points outward, making a fairly impenetrable fortress. As one observer Riley noted, what makes this so amusing is that the birds are using anti-bird material to make more birds, and I say more power to them. I bet everyone knows which bird this call belongs to. Who doesn't have grackles right now? They are one of the first migratory birds to arrive in the spring, and they're also one of the first ones to start their breeding season. So no wonder they take over the bird feeders right away. It does take a lot of energy to recover from a lengthy trip and then to raise a family. My grackles have kind of slowed down right now, but if yours are still not letting other songbirds eat at your bird feeders, here are a few recommendations from us. First, switch to Niger and safflower seeds. Grackles don't really care for that type of seed at all. If you have a Squirrel Buster Plus, you can adjust the tension and the shroud will close with the weight of an adult grackle. If you're still trying to feed your woodpeckers and nut hatches and you have a Squirrel Buster Nut Feeder, go for larger peanuts and switch to the smaller mesh that comes with your nut feeder. Apparently, grackles have no patience to sit there on the feeder and, you know, pack it in nuts and trying to get to it. They will do it for a little bit, but then they fly off and that way the nuts last longer and the woodpeckers and nut hatches are quite happy to sit on your feeder for hours and just peck and peck and peck. Another thing is give your grackles their own feeding station. This is what I do on the other side of our property where, you know, the wild area is. They are quite happy to take over that feeder and I just leave them alone and feed them all summer long. It's not too, too difficult to distinguish male and female grackles. Males have longer tails and they have more of that intense purple, green, black metallic sheen and females look just duller. Here on the East Coast, we have common grackles, but on the West Coast, they have great tail grackles. Though common grackles have been moving west more. Last time I was in Vegas uh, for work, I managed to film a gray tail grackle. It was so much fun to watch them. Check out how much longer and slender they are and how similar, but at the same time different, their call is. Grackles are opportunistic eaters, which means they will eat just about anything. And that includes fish and ticks and little birds and frogs. Grackles are super social birds, hence the large flocks that they normally arrive at your bird feeders. But they are rather monogamous during their breeding season. And even though they start their nesting season rather early, believe it or not, they only have one brood per season. And you think they have huge clutches because they arrive in these huge flocks. But no, just like other songbirds, they only have four to five eggs on average. You know, I often call my two boys double trouble. They're always up to something. And that's where the theme for this photo contest came from. Let's check out the top five. Here's the third place. The second place. And the grand prize winner. Congratulations, everybody. Next month is very generic and I'm sure we'll have lots of participants because it's birds and trees. Good luck, everyone. 
Well, that's it, that's all for now. Enjoy the rest of the summer. I'll catch you in two weeks.